Picture Dr. Octopus scaling a skyscraper, tearing off a bank vault door with one arm while holding a taxi in another. It's one of the coolest visuals in comic history. But is it actually possible? Most people look at the arms and think, robotics. But the real obstacles here aren't mechanical. They are biological and thermodynamic. Today, we are breaking down exactly what it would take to build these things, from the atomic structure of the materials to the nuclear physics required to power them. But first, we have to explain why putting these on would likely kill you instantly. The problem here isn't the arms, it's your spine. In Spider-Man 2, Otto wears a simple corset-style harness around his waist. This is pure Hollywood magic. If you actually tried to lift a 2,000-pound taxi with an extended arm 15 feet away from your body, you are creating a massive lever. Your spine is the fulcrum. Basic physics dictates that the torque generated wouldn't just make you tip over, it would snap your vertebral column like a dry twig. Let's run the numbers. A roughly 1,000 kilogram car held 5 meters away creates a torque load of about 49,000 newton meters. For comparison, the maximum torque a human spine can handle before catastrophic failure is a tiny fraction of that. The moment that arm takes the load, the force has to go somewhere. In the movies, it magically vanishes into the harness. In reality, that force travels through the harness, into your ribs, and shears your spine in half. To make this work, you can't use a backpack. You need a full body external frame. The arms must be attached to a rigid exoskeleton that bypasses your body entirely and grounds the weight directly into the floor. You aren't wearing arms, you are piloting a walking tank that happens to be shaped like a person. This brings us to the materials. You can't use steel. A steel arm capable of lifting a car would weigh so much that the arm itself couldn't lift its own weight. This is the square cube law in action. As you scale up the size of a structure, its mass increases faster than its strength. You need titanium at a minimum. It is roughly 45% lighter than steel, but just as strong. However, even titanium might be too heavy for the speed Doc Ock displays. The theoretical ideal here, and likely what Otto is using in the comics, is carbon nanotubes. We are talking about a material with a tensile strength hundreds of times greater than steel and a fraction of the weight. We can make carbon nanotubes in labs today, but weaving them into a macro structure like a tentacle is still decades away. Then you have the actuation. How do the arms actually move? You have two choices, hydraulics or electric actuators. Hydraulics are strong, look at an excavator, but they are slow, heavy, and prone to leaking fluid when punctured. Doc Ock needs speed. That means high torque electric motors. We see this in real world tech like the Sarcos Guardian XO exoskeleton. It uses electric motors to let a human lift 200 pounds as if it were nothing. But notice the difference. The Guardian XO is bulky, slow, and lifts 200 pounds, not a Toyota Camry. To get the speed and strength of Doc Ock, we need actuators that don't currently exist outside of prototypes. We need artificial muscles, electroactive polymers that contract when a voltage is applied, mimicking human muscle fibers but with the density of a hydraulic piston. Without this, you are just building a really expensive forklift that can't catch a punch. Even if you solve the spine snapping torque, secure the carbo nanotube supply, and invent new artificial muscles, you hit the mass problem. Forearms, plus the exoskeleton frame to ground them, plus the motors. You are now carrying an extra 400 to 600 pounds of gear. You aren't walking up walls, you are cracking the pavement every time you take a step. And we haven't even talked about the biggest hurdle yet. A 600-pound suit with high-torque motors needs a staggering amount of juice to run for more than five minutes. You have built the frame, you have reinforced your spine, and you have sourced the carbon nanotubes. Now you have a 600-pound paperweight strapped to your back because you haven't figured out how to turn it on. The energy requirements for a machine like this are frankly staggering. To lift a two-ton vehicle five meters into the air in under three seconds requires a burst output of roughly 33 kilowatts of power. That is just for one lift. That doesn't account for the constant energy drain required to hold that weight in place or the rapid movements needed to block punches from a superhero or the power needed to run the onboard computer systems. If you try to power this with modern lithium ion batteries, the math falls apart immediately. Look at a Tesla Model S. Its battery pack weighs over a thousand pounds and takes up the entire floor of the car. If you condense that technology into a backpack sized unit, you would get maybe five minutes of high intensity combat before the system died. And that is assuming the battery itself didn't overheat 
and explode on your back. Batteries simply do not have the energy density required for high-performance robotics of this scale. You would spend more time looking for a wall outlet than you would fighting Spider-Man. This is why the Raimi movies were actually scientifically brilliant for focusing on precious tritium and fusion power. Otto Octavius understood energy density. Chemical energy, like gas or batteries, is limited by electron bonds. Nuclear energy is limited by the strong nuclear force, which is millions of times more potent. A kilogram of gasoline gives you about 46 megajoules of energy. A kilogram of fusion fuel could theoretically yield hundreds of terajoules. To make the arms work without a thousand pound extension cord, you absolutely need a nuclear power source. In the real world, we have something called radioisotope thermoelectric generators, or RTGs. We use them on Mars rovers like Curiosity. They are reliable and last for decades, but they are terrible for power output. The RTG on Curiosity produces about 100 watts, barely enough to power a light bulb, let alone a mechanical tentacle crushing a bank vault. Now, you run into the law of thermodynamics, specifically waste heat. No machine is 100% efficient. Even a highly efficient electric motor generates heat. If your suit is drawing 50 kilowatts of power to fight and your system is 90% efficient, which is generous, you are generating 5 kilowatts of waste heat. 5 kilowatts is roughly the output of three or four high-end space heaters running at maximum blast. Now, imagine strapping those space heaters directly to your spine and putting a trench coat over them. Without massive radiators, which the Doc Ock design notably lacks, that heat has nowhere to go. It would conduct into the frame, then into the harness, and finally, into you. However, let's suspend our disbelief one more time. You have the frame, the fusion reactor, and a suit made of magical cooling gel. You are ready to go, but now you face the most complex challenge of all, telling four extra limbs what to do without your brain short-circuiting. The final hurdle is perhaps the most terrifying. You have a nuclear-powered, titanium-reinforced tank suit. Now you have to drive it, but you aren't using a joystick or a keyboard. In the lore, Otto controls these arms with his thoughts. To understand why this is nearly impossible, you have to look at the cortical homunculus. This is a physical map of your body located on your brain's motor cortex. You have specific neurons dedicated to your thumb, your lips, and your toes. You do not, however, have neurons dedicated to four six-foot mechanical tentacles. To control these arms, we have to hack the brain's operating system. First, let's talk about the connection itself. In the early comics, Otto sometimes uses a simple headband. In reality, non-invasive brain-computer interfaces, like EEG caps that sit on top of your hair, are useless for this level of control. The skull is thick, and it acts as an insulator, scattering electrical signals. The signal-to-noise ratio is terrible. To get the fidelity required to catch a falling car, you need to go invasive. This validates the movie design of the inhibitor chip clamped directly onto the spine and brainstem. In the real world, this looks like the Utah Array, or the technology being developed by companies like Neuralink. We are talking about micro-electrode arrays physically implanted into the gray matter of the brain to intercept individual neurons firing. You have to risk infection, scar tissue buildup, and brain damage just to plug the machine in. But even with a perfect connection, your brain simply cannot handle the data load. The conscious human mind isn't designed for that level of multitasking. This is where the AI component of Doc Ock's arms becomes a biological necessity, not just a plot device. The arms must be semi-autonomous. In robotics, we call this shared control or hierarchical control. Your brain shouldn't be telling arm number three to contract servo A by 40 degrees and rotate servo B by 10 degrees. This is too much data. Instead, your brain sends a high-level intent command. The onboard computer, the AI, receives that command and calculates the inverse kinematics, solving the math to move the joints to the right position while maintaining balance. The arms have to think for themselves because your brain is too slow to micromanage them. But control is a two-way street. If the arm grabs a steel beam, how do you know how hard to squeeze? If you have to look at the arm to see what it's doing, you are already dead. You need proprioception, the innate sense of where your limbs are in space. For Doc Ock to work, the interface must be bi-directional. Sensors in the mechanical fingers need to send data back up the spine, which the implant then translates into electrical impulses that your sensory cortex interprets as touch. 
you are essentially hallucinating the sensation of four extra limbs. We know the brain is capable of this thanks to neuroplasticity. Experiments with the Third Thumb Project at University College London showed that people can learn to control an extra robotic digit and eventually feel like it is part of their body. However, scaling that from one thumb to four massive limbs is a different beast. The cognitive load would be exhausting. The brain has a finite amount of glucose and processing power. Rewiring your cortex to run four heavy machinery subroutines would likely degrade other functions. The machine doesn't just attach to your body, it cannibalizes your mind to function. So we have a nuclear reactor on your back, a chip in your brain, and carbon nanotubes in the actuators. Now try to walk. The moment you take a step, you fall flat on your back. This is the center of mass problem. A human body balances naturally over the arches of the feet. Strap 400 pounds of titanium, cooling equipment, and shielding to your spine, and your center of mass shifts drastically behind your heels. To stay upright, you would have to lean forward at a 45 degree angle constantly, which looks ridiculous and destroys your lower back within minutes. This forces you into dynamic balancing. Look at Boston Dynamics Atlas robot. It stays upright by constantly shifting its weight, adjusting its footing, and using its arms for momentum. For Doc Ock, this explains the iconic spider stance. You almost never see him fighting effectively on just two human legs. He uses the lower two tentacles as outriggers, planting them into the concrete. This isn't just a cool aesthetic choice, it is a strict engineering necessity. You need those lower limbs to widen your base of support, acting as active counterweights while the upper arms throw cars around. Essentially, to operate this rig, you cease to be a bipedal human and become a hexapod tank. Then there is the issue of latency. Biological nerve signals travel at roughly 100 meters per second. Electricity and copper wires travels near the speed of light. However, the processing of that signal, converting noisy brain waves to digital commands, calculating the physics, and activating the motors, creates input lag. If Spider-Man throws a punch, your biological eyes see it, but your mechanical arms might react 50 milliseconds too late because the AI is still solving the inverse kinematics equation. In a fight where milliseconds matter, that lag gets you knocked out. You aren't just fighting the hero, you are fighting your own ping. Finally, consider durability and shock absorption. These arms are filled with sensitive gyroscopes, force sensors, and microactuators. If you use them to block a punch from a superhuman who can stop a speeding train, that kinetic energy doesn't just disappear. It transfers through one arm and into the delicate electronics. Real-world military exoskeletons are rugged, but they aren't designed for high-impact melee combat. One solid hit could shatter the ceramic housing of your superconductors or misalign the proprioception sensors. Suddenly, your arm thinks it is two feet to the left, and you end up punching yourself in the face. To survive, the arms would need massive hydraulic dampeners, adding even more bulk to an already impossible suit. When you put all these constraints together, the sleek backpack design completely vanishes. To make this functional, you end up with a heavy, wide stance chassis with shock absorbers, massive heat radiators, and likely a power cable dragging behind you. You don't look like a brilliant scientist in a trench coat, you look like a walking forklift that is slowly cooking its driver. Ultimately, the verdict is a fascinating split. We can build the robotics today, we have the high torque motors and the advanced materials, but we cannot power them and we certainly cannot attach them to a human spine without killing the host instantly. The limiting factor isn't the robotics, it is energy density and human fragility. Doc Ock isn't just a villain, he is a walking example of why we need power fusion. If you want more engineering breakdowns of your favorite villains, hit subscribe.